Well, g'day, geeks. Um, I'm here to talk to you about digital payments in developing economies, and actually specifically about Africa. Now, small biographical note, I'm not African. Uh, this is an Australian twang. I'm a recent convert to the delights of Africa, three years young. And so I'm still seeing it somewhat as an outsider, but it is a fascinating, extraordinary, complicated, daunting, scary, amazing place. And there are some really, really interesting things going on there. So it's kind of a change of pace from a lot of the stuff that you've heard on the main stage for the last couple of days. And, you know, I'm here because it's my job to talk about this stuff, and I'm a little bit obsessed. Um, but you might be asking yourself, why should I listen to a story about uh, digital payments in developing economies about, about Africa? And I can give you at least two good reasons for that, and maybe a third one. But the, 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 the first of the two good reasons is all the really fun stuff in payments infrastructure in the world today is happening in developed economies. Why? Because they're more greenfield, because there's more opportunity, because they're not trying to graft new stuff onto old stuff. They've got an opportunity to build the world anew. That's really exciting. It's also scary, and a lot of stuff can go wrong, but it's also uh, something we can learn from. I think we've all had a, a discussion about or started to examine the incredible phenomenon in China. There are some equally amazing things happening in, in Africa. You may remember that before China, the big fad was to talk about uh, M-Pesa in Kenya and Uganda. A lot of that sort of stuff is still going on in, in Africa. So there's lots of really fun, interesting things to look at and think about and, and see what might uh, apply, what we can take into the developed economies that we live in. That's the first thing. But the second thing is, to me, more important. And it's this. This is an opportunity to do a lot of good for a lot of people. Uh, I, I'm a middle class kid who grew up in the suburbs of Sydney, right? Uh, I, have, uh, I have had a comfortable life. There are people in Africa who have nothing. And one of the ways for them to end up having something, interestingly enough, is to improve the way the payments infrastructure works. Yes, they need lots of other stuff as well, but actually their lives are not going to get fundamentally better if they don't have a better way of organizing commerce around themselves. And that's all the payment system is. So this is a very human talk about payments. This is, in fact, I'm not going to have any stats. I'm not even going to have any words on the slides, you'd be glad to know. This is a really cathartic moment for me. Um, I normally have lots of words on slides because I'm a lawyer, right? But I'm sort of evolving away from it. So Africa's helping me here, right? Um, image of Africa, right? This is, this is the reality we deal with in Africa. Not in my comfortable office in Johannesburg, I admit, but this is actually what most of Africa is like. Uh, and I can tell you one thing for sure, at least one of the people in that photograph statistically has a smartphone. That's interesting, isn't it? There's probably not a television in that shack, but there is a smartphone, probably. And if there isn't now, there soon will be. And yes, there's lots of problems to solve which are not to do with payments, like the cost of data is a scandal in South Africa. Uh, like, you know, the smartphones are still too expensive. But the fact remains that for many, many of the 1.2 billion people in the continent of Africa, their first experience of advanced technology is going to be a smartphone, probably before they see a television. Uh, and, uh, and it's going to be something that will be used and valued by their family as the first major bit of um, uh, technology purchase, right? So it's kind of, that makes life kind of easy. We know that the opportunity to improve lives and to make a difference is going to be built around the mobile phone. Um, anybody know what this is? That's what's left of a cash in transit van after it's been dynamited. So uh, if we go back here, this is about one of the big challenges of Africa, which is poverty. And we can do something about that. But actually, we can do something about this too. This, in my view, is why cash is bad. Right? 
uh, there's a company called SBV in Johannesburg which does all, a, lo a lot of the cash in transit stuff, right? And I remember being shocked when I first went to their head offices because they've got a memorial in their sort of front garden area to people who've lost their lives in the line of duty. We're not talking in wars, we're talking about just doing their day-to-day -day jobs, right? Uh, cash is a big problem. Cash creates crime, particularly in highly unequal societies. The more we can do to move people away from cash, the better off everybody's going to be. This is costing the banks a fortune, this stuff. There were more than 300 of these last year in South Africa alone. So we need to do something about that. And again, the mobile phone is the answer. Now, this is an aerial shot of a section of Johannesburg. And this is one thing that I think might be quite unusual about South Africa uh, relative to other uh, African countries. The inequality is striking. Uh, you can see on, the, uh, on your right-hand side there, uh, there's a whole bunch of people in those corrugated iron shacks who don't even have addresses. You can't prove, they can't prove where they live. They have to say, it's the third shack on the left after the big tree, right? Uh, they, uh, many of them are undocumented. So they can't get, if they're, if they're running the local Spaza shop, which is like the little you know, uh, supply uh, shop, uh, then they probably can't get acquiring facilities from uh, a bank because they can't prove who they are. Uh, and then right across the road, you've got Western economy, right? So one of the really striking things about South Africa is, that, is the extent of that inequality. And that, of course, gives us a great opportunity because we've got the wealth to do something about this. We just have to get the infrastructure to work for us properly. And the way to think about payments, and this was a big aha moment for me when I went to Africa, is it's no different from any other infrastructure that helps an economy develop. It's no different from roads and bridges and hospitals uh, and schools. Um, it is just as vital to the proper function of the com economy. It may even be more important in the short term because if you can get the economy uh, working smoothless, smoothly and frictionlessly, then you develop entrepreneurialism and you get the opportunity for people to improve their own state. That at least is what the Gates Foundation thinks and which is why it's pouring money into Africa at the moment, specifically into payments infrastructure. So here's our, um, uh, our happy African on, on her mobile phone. Um, we've got no doubt that this is all gonna be about mobile payments, but the really interesting question is, how is it gonna be about mobile payments? And there are at least three different ways in which this might evolve, and we've seen examples of them in different countries. M-Pesa I mentioned before, so this is the telco-driven solution. Um, it's uh, an incredibly powerful model, but the secret to understanding it is that it exists on a web of cash agents spread out across the country, a point not often understood about M-Pesa, right? Uh, the critical way that it works is that you have to be able to go to someone to cash in and cash out, and that has to be someone sitting in the village. I'm not taking anything away from M-Pesa. It has done an extraordinary job of transforming uh, a, a lot of the economy around it in, in Eastern Africa in particular. Uh, but as it evolves, it's gonna have to develop a much more friction, frictionless experience, uh, and it's gonna run into some problems around the basic structure here. Who decides what services are available on M-Pesa if the telco has all the data and has your money as well. This is a problem that no one's worrying about too much right now because they're getting the benefits of the system, but in the long run, there's an opportunity here to think about a different model. We talked about these guys uh, a lot in Africa at the moment, and I think a little bit at the conference too, WeChat and Alipay. Uh, similar kind of idea here. Again, we're using an app this time on the phone uh, to supply a very wide range of services. And the platform power of these things is extraordinary. They have transformed uh, the Chinese retail commerce environment in just the last 10 years, and they're uh, working very hard on doing that all over the world. Uh, that's fantastic, but again, have we got the right structure here? Have we got the, the right balance between competition and uh, coordination and control, if you like? Are we giving people the option of developing and innovating in the way that works for their communities? Uh, that's a bit of a question mark in my mind. 
This is a more traditional picture. This is one of the South African banks that has quite an advanced uh, app solution of its own. I think the banks have got a challenge here. Uh, at the moment, they're all pursuing app-based strategies which say, can I get the maximum number of eyeballs from my customers for as long as possible on my app? And can I add services, including non-banking services, to encourage my customers to come to my app? That works at the uh, higher end of the market, but it's got a long-term challenge because it's hard to imagine the banking app competing with general social apps. I'm not quite clear why it is that I'll spend more time on my banking app than I will on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Uh, unless my bank wants to go into the business of being a content platform, seems to me that's going to be a difficult competition for the bank to win by itself long term. So there's a bit of a challenge there about how banks play in this new space, and maybe that even leads to a rethink about banking. I haven't really got time to go into that, but it's an interesting idea. So we know, what we know is that um, one of the necessary conditions of future economic development in Africa is very, very low cost, frictionless uh, payments infrastructure that is non-cash. This much we know. We also know that that is going to happen through the mobile phone. There is absolutely no doubt about that. It is the only infrastructure that will reach everybody and has the capacity. What we still don't know is how actually is that going to play out. And uh, I'm not seeing the central banks. There are, I went to a conference three weeks ago, there are 42 central banks in Africa. And they're aware of this problem, but they don't know what the hell to do about it. All right. So there's a big challenge, a big public policy challenge here about how we set this up in a way which is sustainable long term and don't just sort of blunder into an outcome which might not be the best one. Uh, there's a lot of work to do here, uh, but there's also a fantastic opportunity. If we can set up a framework which maximizes the opportunity for innovation, which gives people the freedom, and I think Tim Berners-Lee talked a little bit about this in his discussion yesterday, Ideally, you want each of the guys holding the mobile phone to have control of their own data and have control of their own value and to be able to pick and choose who looks after each for them. And then separately, ideally, you want them to be able to pick which platforms they interact with other people on and which content they consume. The trouble, that's a lovely vision and I think it's a really valuable one which we should try and pursue. It's going to be hard to pull it off, though, without a lot of government coordination and a lot of industry coordination, because it requires rules and standards about who gets to do what and who is not allowed to aggregate and then control too much of that marketplace. This is a really complicated problem, and we're, we're going to try and solve it now in a continent which has 54 countries, 1.2 billion people, thousands of cultures. That's kind of a big challenge. Nevertheless, I think it's an urgent one, and this is my third reason for why I think it's worth us in Western economies thinking about this a little bit more, because if we can help come up with a great model for that, that model is universal. That model is not just for developing economies, but seems to me to be the evolution we should all be looking forward to. Thanks very much. <laughs>